Hello, this is Stuart Battle with the LaRouche organization. It's August 11th, 2023, and this is your daily video update. So, um, what's happening now is a complete freakout coming increasingly from the major mouthpieces in Western media, um, as well as, uh, you know, as well as the political circles in, uh, realizing that there, there really is a new system in the world, uh, and, and that it is not going to be put back in the bottle. Uh, this is in reference to the BRICS, which is having its summit coming up in a little less than two weeks in South Africa this year, where what will seriously be on the table for discussion is a new currency system, um, major new trade policies that are leaving behind the the U.S., the dollar, um, and, the, and those policies of post-industrial looting, as opposed to what has been seriously shown to be a real alternative, which is that of, uh, for example, China and the Belt and Road Initiative, massive investment in infrastructure, um, in poverty alleviation. For those that saw what happened at the St. Petersburg Forum uh, among, among African nations and Russia a couple weeks ago, um, not only were there major trade agreements and um, other types of economic agreements, but increasingly things like space exploration um, and things like nuclear energy, where uh, even some of the poorest countries in the world are currently in discussions with Russia on uh, new nuclear power plants, which is how you develop uh, an economy. So, um, so again, this is not going to be put back in the bottle. And what we're seeing increasingly is freakouts that, uh, that that's exactly the, the case. So um, in the recent days, there were articles in the Atlantic Council uh, screaming about this. Similarly, The Economist had one the other day, um, where essentially they are trying to create as many divisions, as many rumors that there, there won't be a common agreement amongst the BRICS. There really isn't that much interest. There's really just um, uh, alliances of convenience or, or fear, scared to, to speak out against it but that there's nothing successful which is going to come out of this year's South Africa summit. Um, and, uh, and if it is, it's going to be very bad because it will undermine the credibility and it's all anti-democratic, essentially. Um, so there's this kind of noise that is swirling around. I think it's just important to, to point it out. Um, what's What's interesting now in the case of, of Niger, which has come up, is that it has provoked a real recognition amongst those who are willing to, to, to see it, that the entire Western policy for Africa, and by implicitly uh, the, the entire global south, and there's a real crossroads of what to do. Uh, Case in point in this was an article in the Financial Times. There was one yesterday, and then there was another one um, a little over a week ago, where what was said, just to summarize briefly, was essentially that the U.S. and Europe failed to recognize the strategic importance of Africa and instead treated it simply as a humanitarian problem. Um, and because of that, increasingly Africa is, is turning towards China and increasingly towards Russia, they say. And then they end by saying only by taking the continent more seriously and by helping it prosper can they make up lost ground. Now, um, you know, I just want to point out because Niger was a French colony for centuries. Um, it's, a, it's, it's one of the Francophone Africa countries, which um, up until three weeks ago was, was essentially still uh, under 
neo-colonial domination by France. Uh, there were several, I think as Mike Billington mentioned in yesterday's update, there was uh, over the last two or three years, there's been three or more other Francophone African uh, coups which have thrown out the Western supported governments in favor of a more uh, independent policy. Um, Niger, of course, is extremely rich in raw materials. Uh, one of the key ones is uranium, which is a, is a major importer, uh, France is a major importer of, because France relies on nuclear power for over 70% of its electricity needs, um, which is, of course, uh, totally natural that France would use large amounts of nuclear power. However, let's look at Niger, who, whose population uh, of only 15% of their population has access to electricity in the grid. 85% does not have any reliable access to electricity. So um, it doesn't take a genius to notice that the French policy of, of so-called friendship has gotten them nowhere over the recent decades and I think clearly points out this double standard and the the nut to be cracked, so to speak, if there is going to be a real uh, change in policy and an opportunity to um, to actually do something substantial uh, of friendship with countries in Africa and beyond. So I can only say that if what the Financial Times says is genuine, that they desire to make Africa more prosperous and to uh, join in more in collaboration with the Western world, then we at the LaRouche organization have a proposal, and that is build the Grand Inga Dam, the magnificent and um, very future-oriented project to tame the Congo River, uh, the second largest in the world, only behind the Amazon River, which would generate anywhere between uh, 40-something gigawatts of electricity and some, some estimate maybe upwards of 70 to 80 gigawatts um, of electricity in the poorest part of the world. This, um, this certainly would have an effect on the view of Western liberal democracy if such a thing could be brought about. Um, so, you know, I, I say that a certain amount, uh, tongue in cheek, but I think the, the point to be made is that this is a train which has already left the station and you're not going to corral and convince members of the global South to turn away from Russia and China without there being a change in U.S. and Western policy itself and embrace the actual needs of, of a world that is growing and developing and eradicating poverty, which is so clearly the demand from, from so much of the world right now. Um, so the irony is that this would actually require that the U.S. change its outlook and return to its previous policy of the American system and of nations that are committed to a higher idea of uh, sovereign nation states and a collaboration between, between each other towards, uh, towards a common interest, um, which is exactly what uh, those of us who are, who are, you know, alive and active in uh, the U.S. and Europe today should be working towards. Um, now, I just want to mention something quickly on uh, on this subject because what's come out now is that this this is increasingly the discussion among the members of the BRICS. Um, the South African finance minister was interviewed last week about some of the discussion going into the BRICS summit coming up um, coming up in a couple weeks and he made the point that the uh, the BRICS Bank, which is called the New Development Bank, is doing as much as it can to find new means of, of raising funds, raising capital, and getting into local currencies to do so. Now, the New Development Bank has been somewhat 
hamstrung since it was founded because it's not been able to find large enough sources of capital to generate um, the kinds of loans necessary for, for large scale economic projects and infrastructure projects. Um, however, it appears that may be on the table to be discussed. And um, previously they're, they've had to rely on euros and dollars for its main base of capital. And the fact that this is now being opened up to discuss more, uh, more the use of, of local currencies, um, I think gives a sense that there really is a potential for this thing to take off and for there to be a real spirit of development that, that takes over. And the question that um, Paul Gallagher of Executive Intelligence Review poses in this, in this discussion is, what if the members of the New Development Bank, who, who of course are discussing the expansion of the BRICS, bringing in a few new countries to join um, at the summit this year, one of which may be Saudi Arabia, there's other discussions of, of possibilities. Um, Saudi Arabia would be particularly interesting because its, it's, um, its capital basis would, would greatly increase what the, what the BRICS would have available. So what if in this context, instead of using dollars and euros, the New Development Bank issues national bonds as credit in the New Development Bank backed by their their individual gold reserve um, gold reserves within their nations that would create multiplication um, you know multiple factors above what it currently has and can utilize for investment into infrastructure projects amongst BRICS and other countries um, so whether or not and how much this is this is uh, thoroughly being discussed, we, we don't exactly know, but certainly it will be the determining factor of how much of a transformative effect this, um, this, new, uh, this new process that is, is growing and taking off amongst the BRICS will have. So to conclude, I think that we really are in a world historic uh, transformation right now where the, the, the previous policy of geopolitical confrontation and intimidation, arm twisting of nations to, to go along with this policy, including at home, including the, the mass censorship and uh, political blockages that, that we've seen, it cannot continue. It will not be able to recruit or, um, or, or make any lasting effect in, in the majority of the world any longer. Um, only a policy which, um, you know, which encourages and promotes this concept of, of economic development and the, the right to a future for all. Um, only a policy like that can function, uh, as, as is seen in the case of so many of these African countries who refused to go along with the condemnation of Russia over the, over the Ukraine conflict. So ironically, that means that the US and Europe must overthrow this, this ridiculously destructive policy run by Wall Street in the city of London, and instead rediscover their old, uh, you know, the old uh, policies that actually made our nations powerful and productive in the past. The, the policy of Lincoln, the policy of Franklin Roosevelt, um, you know, the, the policies that rebuilt uh, Europe after the war that, that did show a certain sign of, of orientation towards, towards productive development. Um, these have to be revived right now if the world is to have a future and I think I'll just end by saying that any of us who are, uh, who are active, who are thinking in the U.S. and Europe and in Western countries generally are, are urgently needed today 
to to raise their voices, to weigh in, and to mobilize in this fight. So, um, so please uh, be active, work with us, mobilize with us, bring in your friends and family to to do the same, and um, we will we will be in touch. I believe Harley Schlanger will be back on Monday with us. So um, stay tuned, and thanks for tuning in. Hello, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our videos. Support our independence to produce videos like these. Become a member of the LaRouche organization at thelarouche.org slash member. By becoming a member for $25 or more, you'll get special access to the EIR Alert daily briefing and weekly magazine, which is what I read to stay on top of things.